there's still this desire to get answers to the why question that if if we're if the world is a simulation if we're living in a simulation that there's a programmer uh, like creature that we can ask questions of there's okay this, well this, I mean, let's let's pursue the idea that we're living in a, a simulation which is not not totally ridiculous by the way um <laughs> there we go <laughs> um then you still need to explain the programmer the programmer had to come into existence by some the, I mean, even if we're in a in a simulation the the programmer must have evolved or if if he's in a in a sort of or meta, she or she if she's in, if she's <laughs> yeah. in a meta simulation then yeah. The the meta meta programmer must have evolved by 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 a gradual process. You can't escape that fundamentally. You've got to come back to a a, a, a gradual incremental process of explanation to start with. <laughs> There's no shortcuts in this world. Uh, from no, that. exactly. <laughs> but uh, may, maybe to linger on that point uh, about the simulation, do you think it's an interesting? Uh, basically, talk to uh, board the the heck out of everybody asking this question, but uh, whether you live in a simulation, do you think, first, do you think we live in a simulation? Second, do you think it's an interesting thought experiment? It's certainly an interesting thought experiment. I first met it in a science fiction novel by Daniel Galloy called um, Counterfeit World, uh, in which um, it's all about, I mean, our, our, our heroes are running a gigantic computer which which simulates the world and um, and something goes wrong. And so one of them has to go down into the simulated world in order to fix it. And then the the, the denouement of the thing, the, the climax to the novel is that they discover that they themselves are in another simulation at a, at, at a higher level. So I was intrigued by this and I love others of Daniel Galloy's science fiction novels. Then... Um, it was revived seriously by Nick Bostrom. Bostrom, talking to him in an hour. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, he goes further, not just to treat it as a science fiction speculation. He actually thinks it's positively likely. Um, yes. I mean, he thinks it's very likely, actually. Well, he, th he makes like a probabilistic argument, which you can use to come up with very interesting conclusions about this, the, the yes. nature of this universe. I mean, he, think, he thinks that, 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 that we're, we're in a simulation done by so to speak, our descendants of the future, the, the, the yeah. products, of, but it's still a product of evolution. It's still okay. ultimately going to be a product of evolution, even though the super intelligent people of the future um, uh, have created our world and you and I are just a simulation and this table is a, is a simulation and so on. I don't actually in my heart of hearts believe it, but it, but I, I like his argument. Well, so the interesting thing is, um... So I agree with you, but the interesting thing to me, if I were to say, if we're living in a simulation, that in that simulation to make it work, you still have to do everything gradually, just like you said. That even though it's programmed, I don't think there could be miracles. Otherwise, well, well, no. I mean, the the programmer, the, the higher up, the upper ones have to have evolved gradually. However, the simulation they create could be instantaneous. I mean, it, they could be switched on, and See, we and we come into the world with fabricated memories. True, but what I'm what I'm trying to convey. So you're saying uh, the the broader statement, but I'm saying from an engineering perspective, both the programmer has to be slowly evolved, and the simulation because it's v like oh I, yeah from okay. an engineering perspective. Oh yeah, it, it takes a like, long time to write a program. <laughs> uh, no, like j just I don't think you can create the universe in a snap. I think you have to grow it. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> that's an that's a good point. That's an arguable point. By the way, um. I, I, I have thought about using the Nick Bostrom um, I, idea to solve the riddle of how you were talking. We were talking earlier about why the human brain can achieve so much. Mm -hmm. um, I thought of this when my then hundred year old mother was marveling at what I could do with it with a smartphone, mm -hmm. and and I could you know call look up anything in the encyclopedia. I could play her music that she liked and so on. She said, it's all in that, in that tiny little phone. No, it's, it's out there. It's, it's in the cloud. It's, and maybe what most of what we do is in a cloud. So maybe uh -huh. if, if, we're, if we are a simulation, yeah. then um, all the power that we think is in our skull, it actually may be like the power that we think is in the iPhone. Um, but is that actually out there? In it's a, an interface to something else. Yes. I mean, that's what people... Yeah, um, 
including Roger Penrose with panpsychism, that consciousness is somehow a fundamental part of physics, that it doesn't have to actually all reside inside no, our but, brain. But Roger thinks it does reside in, in, in the skull, whereas I'm, I'm right. suggesting that, that, that it doesn't, that, it, that, that, it's, that, that, that there's a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a fascinating, uh, a fascinating notion. On, on a small tangent, are you um, familiar with the work of Donald uh, Hoffman, I guess? maybe not saying his name correctly, but uh, just forget the name, the idea that there's a difference between reality and perception. So like we uh, biological organisms perceive the world in order for the natural selection process to be able to survive and so on. But that doesn't mean that our perception actually reflects the fundamental reality, the physical reality underneath. Well, I do think that um although it reflects the fundamental reality, I, I do believe there is a fundamental reality, um, I do think that, what, that our perception is constructive in the sense that we um, construct in our minds a model of what we're seeing. And so and this is really the view of people who work on visual illusions like Richard Gregory, who point out that things like a Necker cube, um, which flip from it's a two-dimensional picture of a cube on 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 sheet of paper mm -hmm. but we see it as a three-dimensional cube and it flips from one orientation to another uh, at regular intervals what's going on is that the brain is is constructing a cube but the sense data are compatible with two alternative cubes and so rather than stick with one of them it alternates between them i think that's just a Uh, a model for what we do all the time when we see a table, when we see a person, when we see a, when we see anything, we're um, using the sense data to construct or, or make use of a perhaps previously constructed model. Um, I notice this when when I meet somebody who actually is, say, a friend of mine, but I until I kind of realize that that it is him. He, he looks different. And then when I finally clock that, that it's him, his features switch like a Necker cube <laughs> into the familiar form. As it, as it were, I've taken his face yeah. out of the filing cabinet inside um, and grafted it onto, or, or used, used the sense data to, 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 inv to invoke it. Yeah, we do some kind of miraculous compression on this whole thing to be able to filter out most of the sense data and make, and make sense of it. That's just a magical thing that we do.